Our gospel lesson for today comes from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most holy God, these stories come from so long ago. And yet still, we need to remember what it means to be created in your image, to be people who are seekers of the lost, people who long to also be found by you. Help us be shaped by your words and your wisdom and your love this day. In Christ's name, amen. Robert Fulgram, the author of All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, shares a story about playing hide-and-seek in the early, hot, dry evening of a June summer. The neighborhood kids are playing outside, and they're playing hide-and-seek, and he wonders how long it's been since he himself had played a game. Thirty years, maybe more. He remembers how to play. He could become part of the game if invited. But adults don't play hide and seek, he says, not for fun anyway. And that's too bad. And he wonders, did you have a kid in your neighborhood who always hid so good that no one could find them? We did, he says, and after a while we would give up on him and go off, leaving him to rot wherever he was. And sooner or later he would show up all mad because we didn't keep looking for him, and we would get mad back because he wasn't playing the game it was supposed to be played. There's hiding and there's finding, we'd say, and he'd say it's hide and seek, not hide and give up. And we'd all yell about who made the rules and who cared about who anyway. And, and we wouldn't play with him anymore if he didn't get it straight. And who needed him anyhow and things like that. Hide and seek and yell is what it turned into. No matter what, though, the next time he would hide too good again. And he's probably still hidden somewhere. As I write this, Brogram says, the neighborhood game goes on, and there is a kid under a pile of leaves in my yard just under my window. He has been there a long time now, and everybody else is found, and they are about to give up on him over at the base. So I considered going over to the base and telling them where he was, says Brogram. And I thought about setting the leaves on fire to drive him out. <laughs> Finally, I just yelled out of my window, get found, kid, and scared him to death. He probably wet his pants because he went off running and started crying. It's real hard to know how to be helpful sometimes. Fulgram 
had a friend who found out he had terminal cancer. He was a doctor, and he knew about dying, and he didn't want to make his family and friends suffer through that with him. So he kept his secret and died. Everybody said how brave he was to bear his suffering in silence and not tell everybody. But privately, his family and friends said how angry they were that he didn't need them, didn't trust their strength, and it hurt that they couldn't be there with him when he probably needed them most. He hid too well. Getting found would have kept him in the game. It's kind of like hide and seek grown up style. Needing to be sought, confused about being found. I don't want anyone to know. What will people think? I don't want to bother anyone. So sometimes we all hide just a little too good. Get found, kids. Better than hide and seek is the game of sardines. This is more of a Christian game, I would say. In sardines, the person who is it goes and hide, and everyone else goes looking for him. And when you find them, you get in where they are hiding, and you hide there together. And pretty soon, everyone is found but hiding together. And pretty soon, it's like a pile of puppies somewhere, and someone starts giggling, and everyone says, shh, you're going to get us all found. And then there's more giggling, and pretty soon, everyone is there. Sardines, that's a game for Christian disciples. We seek the lost and we join with them where they are. Medieval theologians even described God in hide and seek terms, calling him Deus Abscondus, the hidden God. But later, Protestant theologians proclaimed the opposite of Deus Abscondus, and they traded it for the concept of Deus Revelatus, the revealed God. I like that. It's like saying God is a sardine player, and God is sinking the lost and wanting them to be found. And when we find the lost, we find God. They're with them. Others find God with all of those who found each other, and they'll all be together, <clears throat> heaped together at the end <clears throat> with the sound of laughter and friendship. Yeah, I often struggle with the concept of this God who would leave some neglected for eternity, that God would let some be lost forever. And we see in our Old Testament reading today that God, God's self says, even the ones that I afflicted, I will rescue. Even those. So that one day, all will be gathered together. It's something that's so easily overlooked in the theology that has taken over the church in the world, where God is a distant God who could care less about what happens to the least of these or to those who may not know they want to be found. Ali, Ali, oxen free. Come in from wherever you are. The game is over. Ali, Ali, oxen free. Everyone come home. We're going to start a new game. To so all of those who have hid too good, it's time to get found. Speaking of sardines, 
there were a couple of headlines in the news this week. One was about a submersible submarine. Several billionaires, adventure capitalists, took a trip to see the Titanic. And the world followed as the submersible craft they were in disappeared. The same time, another vessel capsized in the sea. This one with hundreds, hundreds, not five billionaires, hundreds, the largest boat accident in the Mediterranean Sea in recorded history. Women, children, drowned. Barely a blip. And it wasn't just that the idea of the submersible submarine going to see the, the Titanic was so novel, and it was. It was an engaging story. It was new, a little fascinating. And so I could see the interest in the story and the care for those lives, but it was the resources. When every nation stepped up that was near those international waters, every nation who had resources nearby, France, Canada, the United States, others, sent their vessels, businesses, corporations, sent things to go rescue these five billionaires out on a joyride. I've heard numbers up to 750 on the other vessel. Nothing. Not the resources, not the people, not all of the uh, Coast Guard and international response. They weren't worth being sought. And I have to wonder if God thinks, the hell is wrong with you? There's a fear in the life of just about every church in America right now. And that fear is that the church, the institutional church, is going to die. And it will. If we do not get after God's own heart and seeking and finding and joining with the lost, there is an urgency in this. And in the gospel lesson, we don't quite catch it in our English translation, but there is a tenacity and a persistence with the seeking of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And it's kind of hard to catch it when we translated it, the silver coin was lost, because a silver coin sounds like a lot. But how many of you, if you had a penny that you couldn't find would tear your house apart looking for a penny. If it was just a normal penny, not the penny they found on Greece for the, what, you, know, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't a special penny. It wasn't a wheat penny. It was just a penny. You would tear your house apart and spend all this energy. And that's what Jesus is saying God is like. He is tenacious about it. He won't rest until they're all gathered in. And even when others start grumbling, saying, oh, they're worthless, what about me? Right? It sounds like little kids at Christmas when one kid gets a better Christmas present than the other one. Well, what about me? Why did you do that? And, and that's what we get to be like. We wonder, we get to be so selfish. And we need to take on some of that characteristic of God. And we don't use that in our church. We don't use the fear. We don't use the threat of hell. We don't use the threat of damnation eternally as a motivation for us to go seek the lost. 
Because that's not the God in Christ we believe in that's revealed to us. The one that says, even those I, who I have afflicted, I will gather back in. Right? We believe in this compassionate, loving God. And that's too bad sometimes. Because our own good theology shoots us in the foot to where we neglect to go out and have that fierceness to proclaim that message and to bring people into the fold. We think they're just going to be okay. We'll let others take care of it. God loves them. But God's clear. He wants us to be a seeker. He wants us to go and play sardines, not just have people seek us out here, but for us to leave this place and go join with them out there. Mr. Rogers understood that all of us are lost and need someone to join us where we are. There was an interview that I watched this past week with two authors, uh, Michael Long and Shay Tuttle. Uh, Michael Long wrote the book Peaceful Neighbor, Peaceful Neighbor, Discovering the Countercultural Mr. Rogers. And Tuttle wrote the book Exactly As You Are, The Life and Faith of Mr. Rogers. And they were both his friends. They interview each other about their books. And they talk about their books and the documentary with Tom Hanks, or the documentary and the movie with Tom Hanks about Mr. Rogers. And Tuttle sets up this great question for Long, talking about that movie. She says there's this character in the film. If you've not seen the film, it's based on one, on a couple of main characters, Mr. Rogers and another, a friend of his, a journalist. And this character is out of sorts and, and lost. And without giving too much away, Mr. Rogers seemingly makes a difference in this person's life just by seeing him, just by seeing him. And she asked the other author, what kind of theology would you say Mr. Rogers has? Where do you see this kind of lost and foundness playing out in Fred's life and in his work? Why do you think that was so important to him? And Long, his friend and the author says, I don't know if I can draw a direct connection, but I can say that this theme is one of the most important to Fred because of what he thought about God. He had two favorite parables, as I remember. The parable of the lost sheep, where the shepherd leaves the 99 to go find that one and the parable of the lost coin, where the woman spends all of her energy looking for that one penny. For Rogers, God is somebody who is relentless in pursuing us, even when we want to run away. According to Rogers, God never gives up on us, and that means any of us, no matter what we're doing, what we've done, where we are, who we are, what we're thinking and saying, none of that matters. God just wants to see us. And that's pretty radical stuff. Long says, God is the creator of a neighborhood that doesn't have any doors, but it does have a creator that goes outside in search of people who have left on purpose and seeks them to bring them back so that they can enjoy life to the fullest. Mr. Rogers shared this quote in one of his commitment speeches. He said, we live in a world in which we need to share responsibility. It's easy to say, it's not my child, not my community, not my problem. And then there are those who see the needs and respond. Those are my heroes, Mr. Rogers said. One of his last pieces of writing 
Mr. Rogers said, it is our responsibility to care for the most vulnerable. The amazing thing is, when we find that tenacity to join with God in seeking those who are hiding and seeking those who are lost and seeking the ones who have been cast out, excommunicated, not wanted, the strange and the strangers, when we finally get over ourselves enough to go out and find them, to join with them, to play that game of sardines and be where they are, that is when the church will come alive. And that is when we will find God and the spirit of life at work. Joining God in that mission, giving up our own lives, is how we get life. The fun thing about all that is that it sounds like work, but it is really, really, really fun. When you go out and you find somebody stuck in a sardine can, smelly, fishy, and you get in there with them and you realize how stinky life can be together, you also giggle. Sitting in hospital rooms, gathering together at funerals, being in, in a doctor's office, and telling dirty jokes, and laughing. That's sardines. That's life together. Hide and seek. Lost and found. May we be people who join in that game with God. Amen.